uh, write programs that have an API uh, that could be an HTTP interface uh, so that they can talk to each other. Basically, this sums up the microservice philosophy. So, we have containers, we have this cool tool, we have this new paradigm, microservices. Next question is, how do we run this stuff in production? And I'm going to hold the answer, hold the answer here, um, but who of you uses, or who of you has heard of schedulers, container schedulers? So quite a lot. Okay. Who of you uses schedulers in production? <laughs> so, schedulers, right? This is basically the answer towards uh, running your microservices in production. So schedulers, again, for those of you that don't know, is software uh, that allows you um, to schedule, to scale up, uh, to orchestrate uh, the deployment of your containers across your uh, server cluster. Uh, yeah, so uh, across your cluster. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, wh where we used to do DevOps and basically define these things inside scripts, right? Um, like how many VMs do I need? Which applications are dependent on each other? We still do these things uh, with schedulers, but on a different level. So no longer are you talking in terms of VMs necessarily. You're talking on a level, okay, I want to update this new container image and, you know, uh, tell, tell my scheduler to, to run it across the, the, the cluster. So, we've basically pretty much nailed down how to run these uh, microservices in production. But then again, the next question is, how do I get my containers there? Ho hopefully the, uh, the answer is kind of obvious. I would say through CI and CD. So that's what, that's what we're going to talk about now, how to get our containers onto production. So the current state of CI and CD. I know 2016 should be relatively straightforward. Your, your CI server picks up code changes and executes any arbitrary amount of steps and then produces an artifact. So let's apply this paradigm uh, to a containerized world. And so, again, uh, picks up the code change. That seems relatively unchanged. Your CI server should still do that. Then it should execute any amount of steps to produce an artifact. That in this case should be a container, right? This is the unit of work that we want to deploy. So what we need to ask ourselves is, okay, so how are we going to build this container? What are the steps that we need to take uh, to actually produce an artifact that is a container? So the first answer that kind of pops to mind is Docker files, um, right? So this is the this is kind of the factor standard for building for building containers locally. Um, so you know, arguably, you would say, all right, um, have my CI server just execute that Docker file and be done with it, and I have a container. Well, in essence, this is true. Like this works. It does bring a set of challenges with it uh, that we believe kind of significantly uh, challenge how. Uh, how well of a container you build, how well the quality is of your container. Basically, so let's say you want to build an application and you want to add some tests to it, right? Uh, so, um, okay, you have your testing frameworks, your test dependencies, uh, so you, you basically change your Docker file to reflect these changes to include these development dependencies and these test dependencies and testing frameworks, and then boom, your CI server now is doing tests and still producing a container. But, it's also shipping a container that includes all these test dependencies, all these frameworks that are not really necessary when you want to run this thing in production, right? I mean, this does not really adhere to the, to the microservice uh, philosophy that we just mentioned, right? Do one thing and do it well. No, I mean, this is a container that has testing frameworks and development dependencies. Again, you don't really need those. So how do we change that, right? Like, what is our vision of the, of the correct way? Or the word way, if you will. Uh, basically, the short answer to this is build your uh, containers in two, in two phases, right? You have your phase where you install your test dependencies, where you do all your tests, and then um, even though in the second step you're going to throw away the container, you still want to run this inside the container, right? You still want to run your tests inside the container because you want to get as close to uh, the production environment as you can get, right? Because you're, you're working towards that prop parity, so you want to mimic that production environment. So you can make sure that you know, the behavior is more or less the same as in production. So, but then you're going to trash that container, the testing container, and spin up a new one, and then only install the dependencies that are needed to run this stuff in production, right? So again, build your product in two phases, a testing phase and a building phase. Seems quite straightforward. But also relatively hard to do with Docker files, right? How do you specify that you want to build two containers from the same Docker file? I don't know. So that kind of covers 
uh, continuous integration. So on to continuous deployment. I mean, this diagram is pretty nice, but uh, yeah, deployment is kind of vague and abstract here. So let's try to answer that. So continuous deployment. The current state of continuous deployment is that you would just, in your deployment pipeline, you would kick off a, a script, your DevOps script, that would, you know, Ansible or, or what have you, and then it would take care of deploying for you. Done. Right? Um, again, in a containerized world, this methodology doesn't necessarily apply anymore because you're deploying containers onto a scheduler. And so that's an extra level of abstraction that you didn't have when you were deploying onto virtual machines. I mean, you're not talking to virtual machines directly anymore. You're talking to the scheduler. So the method of deployment here has changed. And the answer of, you know, of how do we do this is quite similar to how you should fix your build pipeline. And that is split it up into two phases. Done. So first phase is to push to a registry where you just take your artifact that your build pipeline created and take that, take that artifact and push it into Docker Hub or any other registry. And then as a second step, just notify your scheduler and tell them like, okay, hey, I have this new container image and I want, to, I want you to take care of it and deploy it onto production. Um, but as you can see, neither of those really like, significantly describe a deployment, right? I mean, the first one is pushing to a registry, whereas if you think about deployment, it means taking your app, putting it onto a server, and then actually executing it and making sure it runs on your service. But pushing to a registry, that's like you know, uploading a file, right? It's not really deployment, it's, it's, it's file uploading. And then the second step is notifying your scheduler. It's also not really deployment, right? I mean, it basically says like, it's an API call. It's like, well, here's a new container image, take care of it. It's not really deployment either. And this is kind of true uh, for uh, building, uh, like a build pipeline, right? I mean, building is not really sufficient anymore um, when talking about complex applications because you want to split up your build pipeline into multiple phases. And this is kind of what we've been seeing as a trend uh, at Worker. Oh, so this is a nice image of point. So, yeah, so build and deploys are insufficient, is what we're seeing. So, build is basically test your stuff, and then run any arbitrary amount of scripts. Like, I don't know, probably some of you have, uh, in your CI setup, have used uh, like inline scripts that are unique to your CI setup. Basically, uh, you define somewhere in, your, in the UI or whatever. So, these scripts are not version controlled, uh, but they, they allow you to execute some behavior, yes, but they're not version controlled. And, so that means if you introduce a change, how do you know if that's a breaking change? How do you roll back? Also, if you hire a new employee, it's like, oh, look at our CI setup, and here are all these scripts that are defined in this UI. And like, there's no real overview of what this stuff like, actually does. Right? Um, so yeah, so any arbitrary amount of scripts, and then your actual, the actual build process of producing an artifact that can be run in production. So deploy, it's the same story, right? It's actually pushing something to a registry, then doing some other things that are you know, arbitrary to your setup, and then notifying the scheduler. And this is what I think, or what we think rather, uh, needs to change uh, when talking about CI and CD in a containerized world. We need to move away from build and deploy. I think we need to stop shoehorning build and deploy, our workflows rather, the developer workflows, uh, and stop shoehorning them into builds and deploys. We no longer, like applications have become too complex um, for uh, the verbs build and deploy to be sufficient. And this is something that we've been working on uh, for the last couple of months. Um, it's something that we've called workflows. Uh, but first, some use cases. So where right, this could be interesting, right? Um, so the first use case is, okay, you want to build your base image, right? So you have yeah, let's say you're building an application, it's containerized. So like, the useful thing to do is build a base image that contains all your uh, developer de like, or dependencies that it relies on, that are necessary for them to run in production. And then based on that base image, you want to create two more images, one that is ready for development. So you want to use that uh, image on your local host for development. And another image based on that base image that is used for it to run in production or any arbitrary amount of steps you know, any other images that you might want to produce. Maybe you want for staging, for QA, uh, whatever environment you can think of, right? But they all build upon the build, uh, that base image. 
The second one is interesting. There was a user that, um, that I talked to, and he basically wanted to deploy his applications to staging. So that's one pipeline. But then another pipeline, uh, he wanted to kind of ping that staging server, and it's like, okay, after 10 minutes, is everything working? He would do like an API call or whatever. If, if, that, if that API call returns, okay, everything's fine. And after 10 minutes, he wanted to, okay, it's fine. Let's deploy it to production. You know, that seems like an interesting use case to me. Um, the third one is pretty interesting, I think, and one of the most interesting ones. So you're building these, these distributed applications, right? So these distributed applications uh, consist of multiple microservices. So what that means is if you uh, push a change to one of these microservices, microservices, that means any number of other microservices will be uh, will be will have to be tested again to, uh, in order to um, see if anything breaks, right? So you want to run integrations, integration tests cross application. No longer do we have a single code base. We could have multiple code bases that all that are all dependent on each other. So again, uh, with how does this fit into a traditional build pipeline, right? It doesn't anymore, because you're not building a single application anymore. You're building things that consist out of multiple things, so you need workflows that facilitate that. The fourth one, uh, create multiple images for one uh, Git source. So uh, consider the use case where you do have like one code base um, that maybe consists of your front end and your API, for example. So you would want to run two, two pipelines or two workflows uh, based on that one uh, git push that you did, right? So one would be building your front end, and the other one would be building your API or your back end or whatever code you have in that code base. So based uh, based on uh, these four use cases, we came up with a list of key properties. So quickly going over them. The first one, you should be able to create as many workflows as you want, right? Again, so in order to facilitate and not shoehorn into build and deploy, you should be able to create any workflow that you want. Uh, build prod or build staging, build QA, not just build. Workflows should be chainable. This is interesting. So, I mean, your build base image should be able to trigger build dev. And your build dev should be able to trigger deploy dev or push dev. Kind of in the spirit of um, your build pipelines should trigger a deploy pipeline, right, in the old world. <coughs> The third one is um, workflows should be able to build on each other's artifacts. So what that means, every, every pipeline produces an artifact. What if I want to take that artifact and then build upon it in my next pipeline? Right? So I, I produce a container, I take that container onto my next uh, pipeline, and I want to keep on doing stuff with it. Number four, uh, workflows should be able to run in parallel. Also important, so again, the use case where you would run Two, two workflows simultaneously based on one git commit, right? So you want to run, yeah, want to have to, uh, want to run those two in parallel. <clears throat> Number five, uh, workflows should be version controlled. So we briefly touched upon this, but you, you no longer want to do these inline scripts that are not easily found in your CI UI or whatever. No, you want, you want to see where a breaking change was introduced. You want to see how your workflow uh, what your workflow is doing exactly. So you want it to be version controlled. And last of all, and again, something that we touched upon in the use case, is that it should be able to work cross application. Again, your applications or your projects consist of multiple applications. You want to be able to trigger pipelines cross application. Right? So basically, summing up, with Worker, we're trying to take automation to the next level, and we're trying to kind of become this. Is Kind of interesting comparison, but we're trying to become this and that for development workflows, right? We want to provide you with as much automation and as high abstraction, abstraction as possible, so you can do, so you can create whichever workflow works for you in this kind of cloud native, um, in the cloud native containerized world. And that pretty much sums it up. So thank you. And Manual quality assurance, uh, where it ta takes place and how? Because uh, it's sort of uh, spooky to, uh, for some people coming from big enterprise world sure. to get uh, stuff out uh, directly to production. 
Mm -hmm. So when and how to efficiently involve manual verification? Yeah, I mean, in the future, so again, right now we have uh, pipelines that get triggered automatically, right? But I can imagine, like, in the future, you, you could definitely have a, a workflow whereby, you know, this is a workflow of type, like, manual, right? Right now we have a, a workflow that is of type git. So you listen for git changes, and we have a workflow that listens on other workflows, right? So in the future, I can imagine a situation whereby you say, hey, this workflow needs to listen for manual input, right? I mean, this is because we're setting up to be as generic as possible, right? So implementing a newer version of a workflow is not something that is far away. Right? I mean, it's not in there right now, but it's something that, that is on radar, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Good. Other questions? Security? I think we'll hear about that in the next talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right? I don't know what you want to know, but uh, it's just uh, security when it comes to uh, the uh, deploying actual deployment to production world, and uh, like what verifies uh, that's actually good piece of code goes to production except the automation test. What if the automation tests were not covering enough? all the critical paths and so on, so like... Um, I feel like that's, I don't know, that's not stupid really... Stupid question. Well, it's not, obviously it's not a stupid question, but I don't know if that's necessarily the responsibility mm -hmm. of, of the CI server to, you know, make sure that you've, that you've written the right tests, right? I mean, there's, there's always going to be human error involved in this, like, that, that's always the weakest link in any automation or workflow, right? It's, it's human error. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we can do too much about that. Yeah. Unless someone knows. Be happy to listen. Well, it should be part of the development cycle. I mean, uh, uh, a critical test is part of development. Uh, you are not de uh, deploying anything to, until after development has been finished. So that should be uh, sufficient enough uh, for the quality of the, the tests. The other funny part about uh, this uh, deployment workflows, so basically we're thinking about uh, having a workflows for a data-driven application. So it's fine uh, if application has uh, two or three microservices uh, that are Spring Boot applications or whatever that is uh, sort of a single uh, single uh, web server having a single database. So let's say if we have two or three, uh, one database node, one uh, application server node type of applications and uh, no databases talk to each other, they isolate. But uh, what if uh, some of the applications have Elasticsearch or Hadoop under them. Uh, what is the general difficulty? Um, we are facing difficulties with uh, having the workflows uh, for data-driven applications that have Elasticsearch in or Hadoop in or Spark in. Uh, and do you have any solutions for that to solve the problem of data-driven fix? It's an interesting question. Um, don't think have a solution necessarily. Um, not really in the business of data driven applications. Um, so, yeah, I don't really know. Um, unless someone else can. So it depends on what you need, right? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, you can use containers with Elasticsearch install mm -hmm. uh, in your integration tests. Um, and you obviously can fill these containers with your data sets or a subset of that. And then write integration tests or other unit tests around that mm -hmm. uh, to make it work. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. Well, there do you need like specific data triggers in a? It's more like Elasticsearch is easy because uh, setting up a cluster of Elasticsearch is simple by Unicast. But when it comes to Hadoop, uh, here comes the tricky part of uh, making sure that that monster works uh, and reproducible uh, as the micro infrastructure for every commit. Yeah, Hadoop is a hard, hard thing. Um, uh, you could obviously set up a cluster that runs, sort of runs the workflows against the cluster. Mm -hmm. If you have a very intricate setup, it could be worthwhile in doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, yeah, I'm not super excited about running Hadoop in a containerized uh, way and sort of spinning up different containers with Hadoop and getting your data sets in there and making sure everything works. Um, so yeah, maybe set up a separate cluster. Yeah. But Elasticsearch would definitely be something that would work. Yeah, Elasticsearch is easy. Don't use Hadoop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, wouldn't that be part of the scheduler? Right? Yeah, but again, so that assumes that's running, right? So it's not part of your, your sort of 
CI CD workflow mm -hmm. uh, per se in terms of it being containerized or not. It would, you know, be a separate cluster running on top of the scheduler that you would run your tests against. Mm -hmm. um, that that would be the I think best solution. Yep. And don't run a dupe. <laughs> cool. Um, so yes, I guess that's it for me. I'll do the next one. I'd say.